John, pleasure to see you. See you, right. Many of yesterday's discussions highlighted the importance of considering the interactions of systems in addressing climate change. Please talk to us about how engineers are already working to address systems challenges posed by climate change. What progress can and is being made? Well, systems are an integral, integral part of uh, engineering. And um, you worry about what happens. I often think of a system as uh, like um, uh, whack-a-mole. Have you ever seen that game where you, know, you punch, you hit something, and then it pops up somewhere else? So things are interrelated. So we do worry about that. And then we look at components of systems and uh, how can we improve those. But they have to all fit together in some way. I, I look at um, our progress so far. We have, we've made progress. We have to, I think, uh, celebrate some of those things. I, I look at uh, climate change as a huge system of systems problem. And uh, uh, there are three parts of it I see. I see is what, how, and when. What is, what do we have to do? What goals do we have? Scientists have focused a little bit more on that. Uh, the how is where the engineers put a lot of time in and focus uh, on how can we get, how can we do this, in what ways, and what are the unintended consequences? And then when is uh, the public acceptance? This is where the, the social sciences, I think, come in. And uh, we have to, uh, you can have great technology, but the public has to accept that, that technology. And there will be sacrifices, and we have to understand that. Medicine, of course, is involved in all three of these things as well. So we all work together, and that's what's beautiful about Climate Crossroads is uh, we can pull all the resources together, as mentioned by uh, uh, Marcia and Victor, and uh, focus on this problem and help the government that way. I think um, in terms of engineering accomplishments so far, uh, solar is a huge success. I believe I've got this right that in the last 40 years, the price of solar cells has decreased by a factor of 50, including inflation. So that's uh, some amazing thing. And uh, the use of something, wind uh, as well. And in fact, solar and wind, those two things were won the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Achievement the last two years. And nuclear, we're making some, some progress. That's a tougher problem. And finally, I'd point out that the engineering, uh, electrical vehicles are catching on. I mean, the, I think people, I heard a talk by uh, the founder of um, uh, Tesla. It's, it's not Elon Musk, it's another person. And, uh, and he pointed out that the electric cars should be bought because they're better cars. And, uh, and I think he's right on this. There's some challenges with electrical vehicles, but uh, uh, electric cars and, and the public is accepting those things. So uh, uh, there's been some successes. Thank you so much. I love this image of uh, climate change as being a systems of systems problem and why Crossroads is such a great place to address those. I know you have a background in chemical engineering, and I'm wondering if you can speak about the potential role your discipline can play in our efforts to tackle climate change. What solutions from the field are you most excited about? First, I'll say we get accused of some of the problems, you know, <laughs> the chemical engineers and petrochemical industry and so on and so on. But um, uh, I think uh, uh, we can, um, in, uh, chemical engineers focus on manufacturing and processes. And I believe 20% of uh, energy is used in manufacturing, something like that. Uh, and I think um, chemical engineers play a big role in that, also, also process engineering. Uh, one of the challenges there is um, uh, heat. Uh, uh, Carbon-based fuels, they're a great source of uh, energy to heat something up, as you found in the kitchen, in fact. But um, we've got to figure out how to, how to get, get it out of the system and use maybe hydrogen and electricity. So I think uh, manufacturing is one place the chemical engineer is going to make a, a, a play a role. I, I think um, batteries and uh, storage, new, new types of batteries are being developed some fascinating ideas. I, you don't know which will come to fruition, but and not, not just lithium batteries, a great battery, but there are issues with critical elements and where you get those and so on, and recycling and so on. So there's work on batteries that chemical engineers are carrying out. And carriers, there's a new emphasis now on uh, using hydrogen as a carrier. For example, if you build a wind turbine out in the ocean, 
where the wind's blowing. Typically, where the wind blows, people are not there. So you've got to get the energy from where it's blowing into, into homes and so on. Um, but if you, if you have these floating turbines which are being developed, then you need to get that, that electricity back in. So what they do is use electricity to hydrolyze water and then form hydrogen and then ship hydrogen. So a lot of neat ideas uh, like that, and I think chemies will play a big role there. And materials development. Material science is almost every field of engineering, but uh, chemical engineering uh, prizes it. And, uh, and I think new materials will be necessary, uh, uh, avoiding un unintended consequences of new materials. Thank you. Um, the next session will focus on the role of institutions of higher education in tackling climate change. How can these institutions help train the next generation for the engineering jobs of tomorrow that will help tackle climate change? Well, that's a good question. I, I spent 48 years in academia as a, as a professor and uh, administrator, and uh, uh, I know very well, and I've watched students graduate uh, and go on to do great things. So the future is in the higher education field. Um, so uh, uh, I think w the curriculum is, is rich we have now in universities. In fact, there's only too, almost too many choices. But I think we can use applications. For instance, if you, thermodynamics is a 150-year-old uh, subject, but if you use problems that involve, that are related to climate change, you can make students aware of climate change at that time. And uh, so, and I tried to do that. I actually taught a course in thermodynamics years ago, and I uh, and I tried to use some examples from climate change. So I think we look at applications of the curriculum. What we have now is good. Just use applications to do that. Um, so uh, secondly, I think we need more effort uh, in in teaching students how to work in multidisciplinary teams. And multidisciplinary means STEM as well as humanities and arts and in design and other things like that. Uh, and in these courses, more experiential learning, they teach not only subject matter, uh, but the students teach themselves in, in terms of their um, work together. And they teach about, they teach respect for other people, uh, different backgrounds than they have. So I think um, uh, teamwork, multidisciplinary teams, uh, we need more of that in higher education. Um, uh, system thinking. Like you may have a great idea in one thing, but it's got to fit into everything else and not disturb it and create ripples, uh, that could, bigger problems than you solve basically. So everybody I think would be wise to, to get some, uh, introduce system thinking into, every professor would be wise to introduce some system thinking into uh, um, their education, their curriculum. Um, and finally, something that was not anywhere in my curriculum when I went to school many, many, decades ago was social awareness. And I, I'm happy to see that that's, and that uh, we are all responsible for the things we do. And, we, and often our motives are good, but we have to, we have to, um, to think about unintended consequences of our work. I have, I have some examples when I give a talk on this of great innovations, and technologies cited as technology of the 20th century that turned bad and had to be like, Freon was a wonderful material, but it had some bad effects on the climate. So, uh, so you have to look at the unintended consequences. Social awareness, uh, equity, all these things have to, uh, to be brought into the curriculum of all STEM and other areas as well. Thank you. I mean, as a Boston University dean, I really love the call to higher ed to participate in, in multidisciplinarity, systems thinking, and awareness. This is terrific. So, John, throughout this summit, we really want to highlight where there are exciting innovations that hold promise for addressing climate, the climate crisis. So I'd like to end by asking, what gives you hope? Well, I'm a, I'm a, a positive person, typically, even when things aren't going well. So. Uh, uh, so I, I am very hopeful. In fact, this conference, I want to congratulate the staff uh, for putting this conference together, a strong supporter of Climate Crossroads. I see so many people, young people especially, uh, here, and uh, this is the future. Uh, I'm not going to see the future. My, my future is more limited, but I won't see things come to fruition, but I think that there's so many good ideas and, and people are involved. So I, I am very 
hopeful. I think one reason I'm hopeful is there's buy-in now. Most, of, I think, the majority of the population thinks that climate changes are due. There's climate change, and it's due to human activity, especially greenhouse gases. So, I think um, the, the fact that there is a lot of buy-in. It's not perfect, but there's more than it was 20 years ago. We uh, had to convince people, and I was actually not a, a believer 25 years ago. But then I got educated, and a lot of us did. I think in progress, I cited this, the solar cells. I mean, and uh, what's great about solar cells, uh, it, it's a niche. It's a, it's a contribution in certain areas. It's not going to solve all the problems, but you don't need the grid for it, right? You can put it on your house and you, whatever. And when, when the grid goes down, you still have energy. So um, I, I think solar cells, the advances there are just amazing from a technical point of view, and they have a great positive impact on society. Wind turbines, great. Uh, uh, technological advancement, and we uh, uh, will see more of that as they, they modify and develop uh, floating turbines for deep for the deeper ocean to put them out there. I mentioned um, progress in electrical vehicles, and also we're more efficient. So we're using less energy than we did before, and I think uh, on a per capita basis. So I think that's those are really good things. Uh, I'm also hopeful because uh, from a personal observation, I developed Anderson's Law, and that is that uh, creativity multiplied by perspective is a constant over one's life. And uh, most of us gain perspective, so it tells you what happens to your creativity as you age. And, uh, um, <laughs> and, and I've seen that in school, my, in, you know, Students were always coming up, so I you can see that I'm not as creative as I used to be. Uh, but um, but I think uh, we, that's why we need the youth in this country to, to lead us in the creativity part. But perspective is still important because we have to make decisions and alternatives and compromises and things like that. So we old folks, we're not, we're not obsolete yet. We're still there, and we have to uh, adjust and kind of guide these things. And uh, uh, so I'm... I'm extremely hopeful. I think this conference is another reason to be hopeful. See the people here in the discussions I've been in. And uh, we'll the National Academies will continue to do this. Thank you. I really appreciate the lens of Anderson's Law. I'm going to be using that. <laughs> um, so we're going to continue to build on the themes around higher education in our next panel of high, around higher education transformative climate action. But I hope you'll all join me in thanking John for a really illuminating conference. Thank you. Thank you.